Today we are discussing the strongest hunters in solo leveling. They are significantly stronger than even most S rank hunters, which is supposed to be the highest rank. It's expected that a national level hunter has cleared an S rank gate, which would be impossible for most S class hunters. As the name suggests, each national level hunter's influence and power can be at least the equivalent of that of an entire nation. These ultimate hunters are even treated like kings in some nations. We see throughout the series that normal rules just don't apply to S-Class Hunters, so you can imagine how much more that is the case for these chosen few. So let's get into all five of these confirmed national level hunter beasts. Just don't forget to like and subscribe if you do enjoy seeing soul leveling videos like this one and want to keep them coming on the channel. So in fifth place, we got Siddhartha Bakchan. Perhaps because he is the weakest, the author has revealed the least about him. We don't even have a picture of him, but there is some stuff that we do know. He is ranked the fourth strongest hunter in the world based on the point system during chapter 149, but it's revealed that this ranking is already outdated and in actuality, he should already be ranked fifth. He is the strongest hunter in India, and considering India's population, calling this guy a one in a billion kind of guy is an understatement. There are also some hunters who have fragments of brilliant light in them. These powers come from the rulers who are a powerful and angelic humanoid race that fought against their arch enemies, the monarchs. There's a lot to it, but the gist of it is that some humans are stronger because they've been blessed with ruler powers, and some, as we'll see during this video, are stronger because they've even been blessed with monarch powers as well. It'll all make more sense later on. Right now I won't go into the whole rulers versus monarchs backstory because that's the topic of a different video, but I will say that the rulers and thus Siddhartha are capable of the skills rulers authority and spiritual body manifestation. For instance, rulers authority is a kind of telekinesis that our main character Jin Wu uses during chapter 126 to get all the giant soldier statues around him to bow down. It's like a heavy overwhelming gravity is pressing down on them until they are crushed into the ground. Earlier versions of this ability can simply allow one to control and move smaller objects like daggers too. However, despite how overpowered it can get, it has its limits and obviously won't work on stronger opponents. And spiritual body manifestation, as we'll get into, is like a powered up transformation. Sort of like going Super Saiyan if you will, but it looks different for every user, as we'll get into. Next, in fourth place, we have Christopher Reed. He's from the USA and thus, despite being one of the strongest hunters in the world, still gets overshadowed by another stronger USA hunter that we're going to get into. He too is a vessel for a ruler and so has the aforementioned ruler abilities. When the monarchs come to take him down, we see his transformation. The monarchs are impressed that a mere human can pull off spiritual body manifestation. Reed takes the form of a giant cyclops with burning fire for hair. But the monarchs were too much for him despite his impressive transformation and he met his defeat off screen at their hands and that was the end of him. Now we're going to get into one of the really hype ones. At number 3 we have the strongest Chinese hunter Liu Zhigong. And I gotta hand it to the author, he does a good job of building the hype narrative around this guy. You're starting to see a pattern here with these guys being vessels for rulers. And Liu is no exception. Meaning he too could use ruler's authority and spiritual body manifestation. This man was the strongest hunter in Asia until the number one on this list surpassed him. He was introduced to us in the story by a sailor who said despite his impressive record, S rank Goto Ryuji, the strongest hunter in Japan, still has a long way to go compared to Liu. And he suggests that it is obvious to anyone who saw Liu in action. Liu is just on another level even compared to S-ranked hunters. He faces a wave of countless flying ants during the ant arc, and keep in mind these ant fighters are hard to deal with for hunters, even for some top tier hunters. Yet this dude proclaimed that he was gonna make every single one of them sink into the depths of the ocean. He took out his dual swords, his weapons of choice, and launched a giant energy blast using them. The sky lit up like fireworks as his one attack killed this giant wave of flying ant soldiers. As he use this attack you even saw the aura resonating off his body to show just how strong he is. Not only could he do what many even S-class hunters couldn't, he even calls these beasts lame and says if the ant Sung Jin Wu had battled was still alive then he would be having a bit more fun right now. So this dude is easily the most hyped character since Jin Wu. I'd even say overall in the series this guy has a more hype aura than the next fighter we are going to talk about who does nevertheless beat him in the ranking system. When a giant from the Tokyo S rank gate was traveling across the sea, we're told it was defeated by Liu. 
We often get these passing references to his power like this, and it builds up his character big time, especially because he never seems to struggle. One of my favorite details about this dude comes during chapter 141, when it's revealed that he's taken an interest in Sung Jin Woo. We are used to classes like E class, C class, A class, even S class, but Liu is spoken of in terms of being China's seven star hunter, clearly a different grading system. But that's not even the best part. As we're told, China doesn't follow the international standard for ranking hunters. Instead, they use their own system and get this, hunters with five stars are considered the highest rank. But just one hunter, Liu Zhigong, was given a seven star rank, end quote. So yeah, not only did this dude get an impossible off the charts ranking, he didn't even settle for a 6 out of 5, but got 7 out of 5 stars. If that isn't an unbelievably awesome flex, I don't know what is. It's remarked by S. Hunter and chairman of the Korean Hunters Association that he supposes the strong recognize the strong, and that's why Liu has shown an interest in Jin Woo. During chapter 148, Liu remarks to Jin Woo that he was surprised how strong the giant was that he fought and that fighting the beast on water made it especially difficult. He's been waiting to meet Jin Wu ever since, the man who defeated multiple powerful giants with ease. He also comments that he is glad that Jin Wu put Thomas in his place, and we'll get into that during our next Hunter discussion. Liu says he's positive that it was Thomas's fault, the two shake hands, and even Jin Wu can't help but think that Liu is a pretty interesting person. As strong as he clearly is, he says that he never wants to fight Jin Wu. So that's enough about Liu. Next, we move on to number two, national rank hunter, the one we already mentioned, Thomas Andre. Andre ranked first in the world among hunters. However, it must be said that more points doesn't mean you're automatically the strongest. At this point, it was said that Jin Wu would rank third or fourth after his victory over the Giants, and yet he'd already beaten Thomas Andre, as we're about to discuss, proving that whatever the scoreboard says, he's the stronger of the two. So Andre is the strongest hunter in America, and before Jin Wu, he was considered the strongest in the world. He was called the Goliath. He too is a ruler's vessel and so can use ruler's authority and spiritual body manifestation as we're going to get into. So we can't explain Thomas's powers without talking about his fight against Jin Wu. They ended up fighting because the S-ranked Huang wanted revenge for his older brother who Jin Wu had to kill long ago in self-defense. Jin Wu, though, was too strong at this point in the story, so Huang came up with an idea. He'd take the revenge out on Jin Wu's best friend Jin Ho, who's like a brother to Jin Wu at this point, and who was also there when Huang's older brother was killed. When Jin Wu showed up, Thomas would have to act not because he wanted to, in fact, he warned Huang not to mess with Jin Wu, but because Huang was a member of Thomas's clan. Since S-Class members are hard to come by, if the two got in a fight, of course Thomas would have to intervene for the good of his guild. From the beginning, it's not really a fair fight. Thomas's guild helps him with the fight and so they clash with Jin Wu's shadow army. While the shadow army can be viewed as an extension of Jin Wu's powers, and that definitely isn't the case for Thomas's guild members. So despite the fact that Jin Wu has to take down multiple opponents with his powers, he still ultimately wins. To Andre's credit, he does deal with most of the shadow soldiers that get in his way pretty easily. And when Jin Wu tries to stab his bare body with a dagger, it has no noticeable effect. Andre even gets some hits in that send Jin Wu flying. It's definitely not a boring battle. They both use telekinesis, aka the ruler's authority, in this fight, and Jin Wu uses it to his favor when Andre pulls Jin Wu towards him. He uses his own powers to keep Andre frozen in place, and the fact that he's being pulled towards his opponent to amplify the force of his own attack. This time, Jin Wu sends Andre flying. Around this point, Andre realizes he needs to go all out, so he uses his transformation called Reinforcement. In this powered up form, Andre is surrounded by armor. He easily collapses the ground below him with his fists. He uses such a high level of ruler's authority that he creates a black hole. Jin Wu admits that he would have been sucked in too if it weren't for his own ruler's authority powers. Cool armor transformation or not though, Jin Wu is still stronger. When their fists clash, Jin Wu gets the better of Andre, and when he knees the knight in the face, the helmet cracks. And then, as it's pointed out by the observers, Jin Wu starts pulverizing Thomas punch after punch. Andre is shocked, asking himself how can a magic type hunter possess this much strength and speed? Even after he's asked to stop by others, since he clearly won the fight already, Jin Wu keeps punching Andre. And that's something I actually like about this series, Jin Wu isn't a goody two-shoes Superman type. 
He can be brutal when provoked, and this is an example of that. Finally, when Andre himself admits that he lost, that's when Jin Woo stops. And this fight is in large part why it's easier for me to see Liu in a more hyped way because Jin Woo never beat him like he did Andre into that pitiful state as the observers call it. Even with healing magic, the damage is too much and Andre has to walk around with a broken arm for a while waiting for it to heal naturally. But it must be said, props have to go to Andre. Not only does he not hold a grudge, he realized that Jinwoo showed him mercy by not wiping him and his entire guild out. And so he actually thanks him and gives him the powerful Kamisha's daggers, which then become Jinwoo's most powerful daggers to date. So of course, if you've been paying attention, you shouldn't be surprised that the number one national level hunter has to be Jin Woo, the main character and the man who left the guy previously considered to be number one in a pitiful state. The best way to describe Jin Woo is that he went from zero to hero. From jokingly being called humanity's weakest hunter, he undoubtedly became humanity's greatest hunter. Whereas the other characters had rulers to thank for their insane powers, Jin Woo's powers are a bit more complex. He had the Shadow Mon monarch to thank who blessed Jin Woo with his own insane powers, but he used to be a ruler as we'll get into, so there are some similarities. Jin Woo became the second shadow monarch and at that point, it was straight up suggested that the shadow monarch and him had come to see things so similarly because of their connection that they pretty much became one and the same person. So the old shadow monarch was Ashborn, the king of the dead, and actually he was considered the strongest ruler and greatest fragment of brilliant light before he fell and was reborn with his shadow powers. However, before he could reach the absolute being whom he wanted to save, the other fragments of light had killed him, meaning the absolute being in their rebellion. Anyways, long story short, the whole system where Jin Wu leveled up was created by a mage called the Architect using the Shadow Monarch's immense power. In this way, even if Jin Wu wasn't immediately a suitable vessel for the Shadow Monarch, he could eventually become one. And eventually, like the Absolute being allowed for Ashborn to be reborn as a more powerful being after death, so too did Ashborn's power allow Jin Wu to be reborn as a more powerful being after his own death. After he comes back from being killed by the Monarchs, Jin Wu has the full extent of Ashborn's power at his disposal. He even gets access to powerful shadow soldiers that Ashborn had under his control in his time. Eventually, Jin Wu fights and defeats Antares the strongest monarch and the king of dragons. He undergoes a transformation like the others on this list, but way more powerful. He uses the power of the darkness to put on armor. He makes a bigger and sturdier dark armor. He says he'll make it so big that every living thing in the world can see it. He summons the power of death onto earth as the dragon king puts it. In this form, Jin Wu says he can feel an incredible and unimaginable amount of power endlessly flowing through him. In this form, Jin Wu's attack even cuts through Antares's destructive flames to hit him. Then they fight physically the king of dragons in his giant dragon form and Jin Wu in his giant dark armor form. Eventually Jin Wu reverts to human size saying it takes a great amount of mana to maintain such power. Antares also returns to a humanoid form and they continue to fight. Eventually Jin Wu slices Antares' body and the dragon king is weakened enough so that when the rulers show up to finish him off, all he can say is that the world is covered by such bright light and such dark shadows, I didn't have any chance of winning from the start, end quote. However, that kind of victory doesn't even satisfy Jin Wu. Instead, he decides to flex by asking to use the Cup of Reincarnation one more time so that he can take care of the monarchs, including Antares, and their armies by himself in the dimensional gap. He says he lost too many people and wants to bring them back. Even though the Cup of Reincarnation has almost been exhausted, there is still enough for him to turn back time just one final time. During this redo, if you want to call it that, he enters the dimensional crack to deal with the monarchs before they threaten the earth. He spends 27 years there and beats the monarchs, including the monarch of transfiguration, who was at the core of everything according to Jin Wu. All he has left then is to defeat the big boss again, you guessed it, Antares. However, it's important to note that time flows differently in this dimension and only two years passed in the outside world. And of course, Jin Wu this time succeeds in beating Antares alone and is only left with a burned but working hand as a memento of the epic battle. Then the rulers suggest that Jin Wu is too powerful to stay in the human world and that his power threatens to change the world or perhaps even to destroy it. But Jin Wu decides that because he has people he loves here and that love him, he will stay. 
he'll take that risk and if new threats appear, he'll deal with them like he did with all the others. And eventually Titans do show up in the unawakened earth and in the old timeline they showed up in the ruler's world. But now chasing traces of the great power that Jin Wu possesses, they change their target to earth. However Jin Wu and his shadow army make relatively quick work of them and unlike against Antares the first time, there is never the feeling that Jin Wu is having any trouble. I don't think that it's a stretch to say that by the end of the series, Jin Wu is the strongest being in existence. So I can't really see any threat showing up that he can't deal with at this point. Remember to like and subscribe if you enjoyed this solo leveling video and want to see more like it on the channel. Feel free to suggest video ideas for solo leveling in the comments if you really want to see some topic covered. And if you do that, it may just be the next video you see. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.